Hey everybody, welcome to episode 23 of Life on Life's Terms. We have one of your co-hosts here, Kenny. And today I'm going on the third part of my bio. Uh, it's basically the third part of the introduction to me. So you can always reference back to see what kind of shit my life has handed out and how it shaped me to be the impeccable human being I am today, here presenting myself to you like an open flower. I am just I have just blossomed to this person who I am and I'm 100% honest and open with you guys and I just want you guys to know me and and if you if you like me like me if you don't well that's okay too but uh so today uh the first two bios uh led me up to where I am today which is from age 25 until current so I'm just gonna dive right in to uh, where I can best recollect that I left off uh so 25 in jail uh I was in located in uh, Spy Hill, incarcerated here in Alberta. Um, I was probably in, I was probably in for a uh, drive while disqualified and a high speed chase at that time. And I was serving, uh, I was serving 18 months, 18 months. And it was pretty devastating for me. To, you know, that's one of the rougher jails, especially for a provincial bit. They have like off the movies where you see with all the, the cells lined up with the bars, that's what they had. So there's no like doors opening and closing, it was bars clanging closed. And like in the morning times when it was time to get let out to feed, you just hear and this loud like crash as the each gate just opened. It was like somebody cocking a, a shotgun right next to your ear. And uh now it was a, it was a hard stretch, you know. I had I had good support though from my mom through that, where she would she would be there to answer my phone calls and uh, help coach me through like the emotional struggles I was dealing with. She was my best friend, you know, and, and she even still to this day she still still is. But uh, while I was there, I like some good things came out of it, and I decided to apply myself in order to get the most out of that experience, and uh, so I. I got my GED when I was incarcerated there, and I also did some experimenting with Adobe Illustrator. And my uh, my my teacher, when I was in jail, what was his name? Mr. Brown. He was kind of a geeky guy, but he was a good guy. He helped me come up with the business cards that I used to start my off-sales bootlegging phone when I got out that time. And uh, it was pretty funny because he was asking, is this, is this legal? And I'm like, yeah, it's legal. Like, I'm just delivering alcohol after hours. It's already prepaid. So he, he took that as the truth, and he helped me make them and design them. And those were the exact templates that I used when I got out when I had them printed. So I I hit the ground running with two feet at, at this beer phone when I got out. It was my to be my main source of income while I went to university. And uh I set up my applications and I was a, uh approved to get into human resources uh at Grant McEwen and my I had to wait 5 months until class started. So in those 5 months my bootlegging operation flourished and it was really good and I had so much fun. Honestly, I can say that at all, any of my side jobs, at anything that I ever did, illegitimately, the bootlegging thing was the most fun. I had the most fun doing it because everywhere I went, I was going to a party and like all the time there was beautiful women and friendly people and the tips were good and nobody had a problem paying what I was asking for because everybody needed alcohol. But one of the problems I came at, came across was finding people to help me work this thing because I couldn't do it seven days a week every day. And then having a hard time, I had a hard time uh, ensuring that they weren't selling drugs on the phone. Now, like I was uh, well known to police still at this time. And even though I wasn't selling drugs and I had no intention to sell drugs, they still followed me around and they still stopped me at clubs just to uh, let me know that I was being watched and that, you know, if you sell drugs on there, we'll get you. So, you know, trying to train somebody or ask a friend to come help you with something and then expect them to stay, uh, stay 
stay diligent and stay true and not sell drugs on the phone a little was a difficult thing to come across. And it did break a few friendships and a couple noses. Not mine, though. Um, however, like, once class started, by that time, after five months of being out, I was a mess. Like, in that five months, I ended up starting using uh, whatever drug I could to stay awake the long hours every night. And my sleeping patterns were all messed up. And eventually, it led me back to crystal meth again. And when, when I started going to school, I, I'd, before class, I'd be trying to get my books in, in order, but I'd be so flailed out that I'd always show up late to class. And sometimes I wouldn't even show up at all because I'd be too sketched out. And I would just hang out, and I'd, I'd lock the door of one of those handicapped washrooms in your university, and I'd just sit there and smoke puddles until class was over. And then my guilt was gone, and I could just leave school saying, fuck it, I just skipped class, whatever. Tomorrow's a new day. But, you know, because of attendance and everything, when it was time to write the midterm exam, you know, I was getting stressed out. I was like, oh, shit, I really hope I can handle this. And then I bombed it. And I absolutely bombed it. And then I said, like, coming to that point, it's like everything that I was working towards for that five months, this is all starting to fall apart now. And, uh, yeah, it was because of my usage. And, yes, I knew. But, no, at, the, at that point in time, I couldn't stop. Um, and then with the with being depressed after after failing my midterms and not being able to hold my shit together, uh, it, things started looking dismal, you know? Like, I started driving around with no license again by myself instead of hiring somebody to drive me around. And and then my drug habit was getting heavy, so I had to start selling drugs again. So I had to start a different phone aside from my bootlegging operation to sell drugs on just to support my habit. And I, I was really stressed, though. You know, I could feel it every day. Like, I knew... The heat was on me and things were going to come down soon enough. And uh, the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was uh, I, had, I, I found somebody to start helping me. And uh, I rented a vehicle f- for us to use. And, and one night, like I was sicker than sick. I was like so sick physically. And he, w- he was working everything. And he got robbed. He got robbed for the vehicle, all the alcohol all the drugs, both cell phones, it, it all got robbed. And I took that as a sign from the higher powers, and I, I threw in the towel. You know, not only being depressed and strung out, but now now I was broke. Now I was, I didn't have anything to start over again unless I went and robbed somebody. And I thought that, you know, like I haven't, like I, I still have my kids, like I wasn't being an active father, and I, there was a lot of guilt over that and a lot of shame. And I wasn't going to continue to beat myself up and be an absentee father. My kids needed me around. and So I was going to change. You know, here, here was, this was a sign I was going to throw in the towel and change. So I went home to my mom's and I sobered up on the couch. It was probably like 12, 14 days into it of just like sleeping it off because I was so like strung out and beaten down and, and, and worried out from all the partying and, uh, prolific drug use and long nights <clears throat> uh that was when like coincidentally i started communicating with an old friend from school uh she was really really lovely girl back in high school but we never nothing ever happened to it. we just had like this hallway kissing and hug relationship and nothing came about it uh but when we started talking again at this point in time i explained to her where i was in my life and what what I was just doing and and my intentions for the future and how I needed to do uh, to try and sober up and get my shit together. So she she was the one that introduced me to colon hydrotherapy. And if you go back to one of our episodes, it's called Talking Shit. It tells you all about this, uh, this procedure, colon hydrotherapy. But uh, she's all holistic and organic, and, and she's really an enlightened being, and she's one of the most enlightened people that I've ever known or talked to. And she taught me a lot she taught me about like poisons and how we poison our body with the foods that we eat and how like our how the foods that we eat can physically affect our consciousness and and the way that we think and our spirituality and our ability to connect with the source uh can all be related to like gut health and like the toxins in our body the foods that we eat the fluoride in our water the the stuff that we program our minds with 
uh, watching TV, uh, the things that we see, the people we surround ourselves with all have a direct influencing effect on our consciousness. And so these were all like new terminologies to me at this point in time, but I got it. I understood it and it, and it resonated with me and I believed in it. Um, I, like at the, I, I think like a year or so prior to this, I started going to church, dabbling in church a little bit here and there because I was in search of, of some form of spirituality, some form of connection with source. And when I went to this uh, like this Christian church, my buddy used to bring me to this uh, rock church. They played rock music. It was all younger people and there was a lot of hot chicks, so I was easily sold into the idea of coming. Although under the, pre, under the prerequisite that we had to smoke a big fat gagger before each time I went in there, otherwise I couldn't handle it. So, like, I did have a little experience with church at this time. But now, what this girl brought to me, she brought to me, like, something that was on a more broad spectrum, that something that I resonated and connected a little bit more, more with, other than the, the, the dogmatic rules and, and the structured religion of, of Christianity. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, she, she also, like, taught me a lot of cool things about about like how we get our energy from the earth and from the sun. She taught me how like human beings are are almost like photo th- photosynthetic and how we can do an exercise called sun gazing where you stare directly at the sun in the first like 20 minutes of it coming up and the last 20 minutes of it going down and you actually get what she she used to call it uh, information downloads. And at these times that we could stare at the sun when sun gazing the sun being like our mother to the earth would provide us with information and not just energy, but information. And it would help us in our path of enlightenment and give us uh, the next step on our journey towards enlightenment. Uh, She also taught me about fasting and intermittent fasting and about, uh, you know, it's not always a bad thing to feel hungry and that how we expend uh, m- the amount of energy it takes to digest a meal is like the same amount of energy it takes to run a marathon. And these things like this were like really new to me, but I was really interested in finding out more about it. Uh, she taught me about meditation and how yoga is more of a spiritual connection than just an exercise. And it can be done in many different ways. She taught me about the power of breath. And she, she was very into breath work, uh, something that still is new to me. And I haven't done much work in it. Or, or research in it, but I, I have read a little bit about it. Um, so anyways, uh, our relationship was flourishing, me and this girl, in this time of my sobriety and me changing my life and doing good. I went for a whole bunch of colon hydrotherapy sessions, and then I clean, I cleansed my body right out. And at this point in time, I was like functioning at a higher level than I ever had been in my whole life. I was feeling like a million dollars. My cognitive ability was up. My energy levels were up. My mood was up. I had more creative ability. I could come up with better jokes. I had a sense of humor. I could play with my kids more, and they loved it. And I like all around, I was a better person. And like, I almost like owe it to this person to introduce me to these things to help me in my my on my path of enlightenment. You know, because enlightenment really is empowerment. And you know, finding out new ways of being and how to live better and, and be a better human and help other people really is empowering. It, it empowers you to create more and to come up with better things and, and to help humans in, an, in general evolve in a proactive manner instead of a destructive manner. Uh, but at the other hand, I still suffered from some hedonistic, uncontrollable hedonistic urges. Because this girl was fine as fuck. And, you know, with her yoga pants on and her dreads, it was something that I just couldn't control. And, I, you know, and her being around me so much and teaching me this information and us connecting spiritually, mentally, and then it just ended up happening physically as well. So in a, in a perfect world, this wouldn't be a bad thing, but it did turn out to be uh, an issue because she was married and uh, she was married for like several years at this time and this was the first time that she ever had an affair with anybody but we went on with this affair for a few months 
of, you know, almost playing cat and mouse around her husband. And a few times it, it got pretty rough. Like she had to let him know, tell him that I was gay. I had to meet him. I even had to be a fucking scumbag and go play racquetball with this guy. While on the other side of the glass of the racquetball court, his wife's doing yoga and she's in the downward dog and her ass is just perked up in the air. And I go to swing the ball, but I completely miss because I'm staring at his wife's ass. It was a struggle. The struggle was definitely real. And I can still say to this day that this girl is in my thoughts and my mind all the time, almost every single day for many reasons. Uh, <laughs> here's a funny story. So I said, let's, let's go come to church with me. Like I, let's, let's have this experience. And she wasn't a church goer. She was super highly spiritual, super. She definitely believed more so in the intangible than the tangible, but she said, yeah, I'll experience that with you. It'll be a spiritual experience and I'll, I'll meditate and I'll, I'll try to connect to source while we're in church. So we go to church this one night, but here's the only stipulation is that her husband had to come. I can't remember his name, but we had a nickname for him. We called him June just because it was like a, he was like a soft summer day. He was just like that Mr. Nice guy that you just, you know, and then in the old adage, right? Nice guys finish last. This guy was definitely finishing last, right? <laughs> and uh, so we're sitting in church and, and she's in the middle of us. And she's in like full lotus position on the pew. And uh, June's over there trying to get into lotus position. And I'm just sitting normally because I don't bend that way. And uh, they had some rock music at first because it was a rock church. And it was vibing that night. It was packed. There was lots of people there. It was really good. And then the pastor comes out. And he's like this young guy because it was like a youth church, right? Like uh, 18 to 30-ish average and uh, wouldn't you fucking guess it, what the topic was? The topic was all about the sacredness of marriage and how big of a sin it was uh, to, be, to be involved in infidelity. The whole sermon, the whole hour and a half message was on this. It's like God was speaking directly to us that day. And... Like all, like I felt like a bag of deep fried dicks. I felt so shitty when I was sitting there because poor June over there, he has no idea. But inside, like my asshole is burning from the pew underneath me. My pockets were lighting on fire. I was shaking. I was twitching. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't fucking believe that this is what was actually coming out of this pastor's mouth. I was like, out of all the fucking topics that he could pick from today on this day, when I'm sitting here with this chick that I've been falling in love with and fucking on the regular and her husband, who is right next to me, who I've been pretending to be gay in front of, I'm here and I got to listen to his pastor talk about this. So before the sermon was even over, I had to get up and leave and go outside for a cigarette and remain outside until everything was over. And from that point on, I had this incredible guilt I had this like rotting feeling in my stomach and I let her know that you know things are bothering me now because like there's got to be a line drawn somewhere maybe she should just come out and tell June about our fucking about our affair that we've been having and I didn't know what to do so I didn't see her much for the next month and a half after that we talked on the phone still regularly though and I continued with my recovery and I continued with my self-development in that time and I continued working on my path of enlightenment uh, until uh, we decided to see each other again and we were going to be safe and in the clear because June was going off to New Mexico to learn how to build an earthship from an earthship building company. If you've never heard about earthships, I highly suggest you look them up on YouTube or Google, Earth Ship. It's a, it's a type of home that's made out of recycled materials. And they're the coolest things in the world and potentially could change the way that we pollute our Earth with our shitty uh, 
uh, non-equal friendly houses that we live in today. But anyways, back to the story. Uh, so she comes and picks me up on this day that he leaves to fly to, to New Mexico or had he, he had to fly to Calgary for the night and then to New Mexico. And she picks me up and she brings me up back to her house. And she wanted me to go in the bedroom. And I said, sweetie, I can't go. I can't go in your bedroom. That's you're in his bedroom. I'll fuck you here in the kitchen. So we had like really, really good sex. It was amazing. And like multiple different positions. And it was the f- like she all around performed like a star, a real star. But seconds after I had an orgasm, I was strewn with guilt once again. This time it was even stronger. And I had a case of the fuck it. And I said, fuck it. I need a drink. I got to get rid of this shitty feeling. I need a fucking drink. Give me a drink. She's like, but you're sober. I was like, I don't care. I just want a drink. I'm not out going out smoking meth. I just need a drink. I need, I don't feel good right now. I need a drink. And she's, she's an empath. She's like, oh, what's wrong? You want to talk about it? I'm like, no, just give me a fucking drink. So she's like, I think I have some alcohol here. Check under this cupboard. So I look under this cupboard and I'm looking for tequila. And I find this bottle of tequila and it looked like it was like out of the movie fucking, uh, it looks like it was out of the Indiana Jones movie or something like this thing looked like a relic. I pulled this bottle out and it was, it had a, it didn't have like a, a paper label on it. The label was made in like some form of metal that was stuck to the glass. It was like stainless steel or it was like softer, like it's like nickel or tin or something like that. And the label, it was stamped. Everything was all in this metal. And I was like, holy shit. And I pour four shots of this and I slam all four shots back to back and to this day it was the best tasting tequila I've ever had and I said wow where did you get this stuff she goes oh I don't know it was a gift from our wedding and then the guilt hit me even harder I couldn't get over it I was like what it just what it was from your wedding oh my god and then I got that rotting feeling in my stomach like like God was just stepping on my heart with a pair of high heel stilettos. And I was like, let's get out of here. I can't be in this house anymore. I felt like I was in a haunted house. Like spirits were breathing down my neck. I was like, where's the car key? She's like, you don't have a license. I was like, give me your fucking car keys. Let's go for a cruise. So I hop in her car and we're cruising around and I'm, it just snowed a whole bunch. And I go to this park and we're doing e-brakes and she's ha- she's loving it. Like we're having fun. She's like, oh, I feel so comfortable where you're driving. I was like, yeah, I'm a good driver. I was pretending I was like Dale Earnhardt Jr. cruising around. And then uh, we went into the city. We got some more alcohol. We started drinking some more. I stopped at a friend's place. I grabbed some weed. And I totally had a relapse like you wouldn't believe. We went to this spot that I like to go to on the south side of the city. And it overlooks downtown. And you can see the River Valley right in front of you. We call it the spot. We went there. We smoked a joint. We had a couple shots. We had a real real moment there. You know, we are good. We are connected. So on the way back, driving, I was, as I got drunker and drunker, I started driving more aggressively and more aggressively. And I was driving on the straightaway, this road through residential. I was taking residential roads all the time, like I did when I was selling drugs. I was taking this residential road that I drove down, drove down a million times before. It was no other, no different this time than it was any other time. And there was no snow on this part of the road, it was dry, and I, I accelerated really quickly, and I was driving really fast. I was probably going about 80 in, in a residential, but then all of a sudden, it bumped. There was a bump. There was like a speed bump, but it was made of ice, and I went over the speed bump, and when I let the car balanced, it slid itself into a groove, into ruts, and I'm going 80, and then all of a sudden, the ruts kind of shifted, and the car went completely horizontal. I'm sliding down this road horizontally, a narrow road, 80 kilometers an hour. And I was like, oh, fuck. This is not good. This is not good. This is not good. And I hit drive pavement. And when I hit drive pavement, it smashed me into a parked car. And then we spun and we smashed into all these parked cars down this block. We must have hit seven or eight parked cars. Airbags come off, punched me out with the airbag. She smashes her head off the window. She's knocked right out. 
we finally come to a halt when we slide across the street and smash into the back of this van. The car stops. We're both fucked up. It's freezing cold outside. The window's smashed open. The car won't start. We're fucking stranded in the middle of nowhere. I got to shake her awake because we were just in an accident. And she's like, oh, my God, what do we do, Kenny? And all I'm thinking is, oh, my God, I'm going back to jail. Fuck. Because at this time, I'm just still driving without a license. And I just crashed the car. And they're going to say it was dangerous driving and all this shit. So I'm like, fuck, we got to go. So we start walking away. And she's like, I got to go back. I got to go back. And like, you know, once the cops got there and ran DNA and everything, they knew it was going to be me driving. My blood was all over the place. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to jail tonight. So you go back. But I told her, I was like, tell tell them somebody else is driving. Don't say I was driving. Tell somebody else was driving. So she called her dad and she went back and her dad came there and fucking waited. And I got picked up from my baby mom and that night I went off and I relapsed completely. I did meth and everything and then sure enough, the cops called my house and I... And I decided the next day, just, you know what, I'm just going to get this over and done with. I'm not going to stay out stay out and be on the run. So I packed my, my jail wallet and I went back in. My jail wallet's my butthole. Put drugs in it. And I went to jail. Drugs in my butthole. And uh, I think I ended up getting sentenced eight or ten months or something like that for that. But uh, I went to I went to another provincial joint and did my time and got out. And this time when I did my time, I met this guy in there, and I'll never forget him. His name is Muggsy. Uh, and he was like, don't hide the fact that you do meth. Just do more meth. And, you know, aside from that, he was, like, pretty cool. He used to rap, and he was all tattied up, and he's he's not afraid to do time, and he was a, he was a fraud master. And uh, me and this guy, we just sat there and conjured up different ways to make money illegally. And when I got out, it was like my he was going to be my partner and I was going to work with this guy. And it was a bunch of poor decisions one after the other. And and to this day, this guy died just recently. I'll get to that, though. Um, yeah. And then when I got out, it was like full fledged. Like m- the very day that I got out, as soon as I got off the bus of downtown from being released from Lethbridge, uh, coming back to Edmonton, I got off the bus. I got high like within five minutes. I seen some guy walking down the street. Yo, you got meth? He's like, yeah. I was like, boom, let's do it. Got it to me. I was high within five minutes getting off the bus. I didn't even go home when I got out of jail. I just stayed on the street. I just, I, I didn't go home for a week after. Poor mother. She was expecting me home and I didn't even show up. Um, that that stretch was just ridiculous. Amounts of GHB uh, and, and smashing crystal meth meat crystal meth and uh having having ridiculous amounts of sex with my with my stripper girlfriend at the time um my, all my like my path to enlightenment went out the window even though I, I there was glimpses of it there was glimpses of it like i would still share this information all the information that i learned from this from that that friend of mine that taught me about spirituality and, and food and different conspiracies and and, and meditation and sun gazing. I, I would share this information with these lower vibration individuals that are in the drug scene. And, and it, it made me feel good to like share this like such useful, good knowledge and wisdom with these people that were like in this dark cave of addiction and, and pain and struggle. I uh, almost felt like Jesus you know, giving this wonderful information to these people that were just living in the dark. Although there wasn't enough to like keep me going or to change my life around, I was just in the strewns of addiction. It was just terrible. I I still I was an abs- absentee father. I, when I did see my kids, I was fucked up, and, and I wasn't like I was degressing. I was rapidly degressing again. Um, and then when I ended up going back to jail, it was the worst set of charges that I've ever seen and I and I regret to inform you guys you know maybe you'll have to catch me in on like our 123rd podcast hopefully by then uh, I'll be able to give it to you or maybe we'll I'll give glimpses and pieces of that last set of charges 
to you throughout our podcasts and you'll have to pick them out for yourselves because it's too fresh and it's too new and it was too serious for me to repeat fully to you right now. So that one piece is the only thing that I'm going to hold back from divulging all of it at once to you. But I was originally charged with arson of a motor vehicle to destroy evidence, hit and run with a person times two causing bodily harm, theft of a motor vehicle, dangerous driving, evading police, robbery, and and assault. So that was like the list of charges that I was charged for. That was the last time that I was in jail. Now this is where the story makes its turn for the best and where it gets me to where I am today. And it started with me going to jail and I, I made a deal with my higher power, with my source, with my God. I said, from this point on, whether I get made on these charges or not, because they were a, a severe amount of charges. I was looking at eight years. If I get made on these charges or not, I just want you to know that I'm done doing the wrong thing. I'm changing my intentions from here on to always do the right thing and what's best for myself and everybody around me I want to give back to humanity. I want to help people. I don't want to hurt people. I want to make my living in life and I want to make my my end, my cut by giving to people, by providing them with value and good things. And things from that point on started to turn around for me. They started with me getting accepted onto the boot camp unit. And uh, so in the boot camp unit uh, I've gone over a couple times in previous podcasts I'll give you a quick rundown it's a volunteer unit uh, it's ran by ex-military guards where you're held to really high standards to be there you got to maintain uh, certain levels of respect integrity and discipline it's a no gang unit there's no drugs uh, it's a self-development unit so they get first access to programs and books uh, but it comes at a cost uh, you have to work out five days a week, and all the guards there are professional personal trainers as well. You have to work out five days a week. You got to bust your ass, and you have to maintain uh, attendance in some levels of programming. You have to do either the AANA programming, and there's inspections like three times a week where you have to like stand. So you'd have to do like military drill. You'd have to stand at your door, and when the guard would be. Like, one alpha attention and then everybody would come to attention at at unison and cadence and sometimes we'd have to sing a cadence i'm not singing it for you right now though i don't have the lyrics in front of me and then uh so these were the sort of the things the unit but really it was like the first thing that i've ever seen at all my years of in, uh incarceration that was positive that had a had a good effect on the inmates and, and it gave the inmates an opportunity to start doing some things to heal themselves internally and to start fixing the problems that they had that were at the root of why they were even there you know they they're not in jail because of the crimes they did they're in jail because they did fucked up shit because they lived a fucked up life and they were brought up by fucked up parents. They have a lot of fucked up trauma that happened to them. So therefore it caused them to do fucked up things innately. They do it subconsciously. You know, people aren't bad people. People just were brought up in bad ways. You know, criminals aren't bad people. Criminals had suffered some severe amount of trauma when they were younger and they don't know how to cope with it. So they build this altered ego that, that they're crazy or big or bad, and then they do fucked up things. You know, and I agree with that, and I, I resonate with that because the same thing happened with me. Because I was brought up in a different sense of a different household, and I felt social isolation as a kid. I was a little traumed out too, and it caused me to have to build this persona that I was a crazy, I was going to be a crazy gangster, and I was going to fucking be crazier than the next big guy down the road, and that was going to get me further places in life. But even though that was a completely false fucking set of knowledge to live by, that's what I chose to b believe because 
of the circumstances that I was around when I was a youth, when I was a young kid. It sh changed and shifted my persona of the way the world ought to be. Now, boot camp was excellent, and I was there for about 14 months. And uh, I still remain in contact with some of the inmates that are there, and I'm a, I'm, a I'm, a ment I'm a positive mentor for them. I still remain in contact with some of the guards that work there too because they expect me to come back there and speak on a, on a, to be a positive role model for these guys that are still in there to show them that it is possible. Because like the success rate for guys getting out of a provincial institution in Alberta is 3%. 97% of people fuck up when they get out and they go back in within one year. And like that's a ridiculously disgusting statistic. But it's true. And it's like that because there's not enough programming for inmates when they're in there. And so this boot camp thing was the first programming that I seen and it helped me and I dove into it. I went balls deep with everything that I could to get as much out of it as possible because that in that the agreement that I made with my, my source, my higher power, you know, from this point on, my intentions are to help be of good to, to everybody around me and myself. So I applied myself in all, all the programming. And when I was there, there was AA, I, and I chaired AA meetings for eight, eight months. And I also became a peak leader. And the, there was this program called PEAK. It stands for Positive Energy Action and Knowledge. And the PEAK program was really good because there was a whole bunch of self-development and self-help books that were available to these guys on the boot camp unit. And they were provided for by the guy who created the PEAK program. His name's Howie Hoggins. And he was there and he would kind of facilitate these meetings once a week. And then two or three times a week, other words, when he wasn't there, he would designate a certain amount of of guys to facilitate these meetings on his behalf. And I became one of those guys because I was sincere and passionate about it. I wanted to change myself and I believe that I could help other people change as well. And, you know, I think that's one of the, the things about my recovery is that because I've, I've remained consistent in helping other people learn the next good thing or do the next good thing, or I can kind of motivate the next guy to make the next good decision for himself and those around him, that that keeps me accountable and that helps me stay on course and do what's good for me next. That's a huge part to my recovery. And, and like I don't like to even say that I'm in recovery anymore. I like to just say I'm recovered because those are my intentions. You know, it's my intention to always do good and help others do good. And therefore, if that is my solid intention, then I can't really hurt myself and I can't really hurt others around me because I don't mean to, you know, like I don't have it in me anymore. I, I've given it up. So what I've had to do and what this program helped me do was the person like Kenny from age six, five, four even, from Kenny at age four, I think at Braun age four, I lost my innocence. I don't know how, but that's where I feel it left me until... Kenny at 28, I had to, I had to kill that person. I had to kill myself in a figurative sense. I had to kill my ego and I couldn't survive without any ego. I still needed some identity. But my identity was going to be based off my actions, and my identity from that point on was going to be based off of doing good. And I'm not like holier than thou, as you can tell. I'm far from it. But my intentions now today are still good, and I'm feeling good. And so I was on boot camp for 16 months. The program was great. It changed my life. It changed my perspective on everything. It got me fit. You know, I looked at myself in the mirror on boot camp one day and I knew from this point on I was going to be good. The guard says, gents, when you go back in your cells tonight, look in the mirror and unfuck yourself. And that was Mr. Vey that said that. And he's fucking priceless. I love that guy to death. And I went back in the mirror. And I looked at myself in the face and I said, Kenny, you're unfucked. And I, dead straight in the eyes, Kenny, you are unfucked. And from that point on, I've been unfucked. Like there's nothing that touches me. Like I, I'm unfuck withable. Okay? Like you cannot fuck with me anymore. I, a bad event can happen. I can have some emotional fucking shit go on in my life. My fucking friends or family could fuck with me or something can ha bad can happen. And it, like, it doesn't phase me anymore. 
because I've created a belief system that I myself am in control of my emotions and my thoughts. And these are some of the things that I learned from the books on peak. You know, whether it's by Tony Robbins or Wayne Dyer or Deepak Chopra or Louise Hay or uh, like all, all these self-development people, uh, Icar Toll. Like I know that I am in control of my thoughts. Therefore, I can control my feelings and emotions. And if I can control my feelings and emotions, I can control the things that I bring around me because our heart center is magnetic and our heart center is what induces the law of attractions, not just our thoughts. So if I generate feelings of wealth, I can attract wealth. If I generate feelings of love and happiness, I can attract more love and happiness. If I generate feelings of health and wellness i i can cure any illness or i can i can keep my body in a good healthy state and i learned this from reading the books i read oh some of the best material i ever read was channeled through uh uh oh i'm having a brain fart right now the girl who the girl who does the law of attraction stuff uh okay i'm just going to keep going it'll come back to me so I know that, you know, energy is a real thing. Energy is a real thing, and we're all connected, you know, through, through string theory or whatever theory, but we are connected, kind of like the matrix. And, like, these are my belief systems now, and this is what helps me stay on course too, is that because I've developed a set of belief systems that enables me to empower myself on my own accord, that no external circumstance can fuck with me anymore I am internally driven I am internally abundant therefore I will be externally abundant I know now that whatever image I hold true in my imagination will come to pass if I hold an image of me being successful doing this podcast then eventually with enough hard work and perseverance and me continuing to hold this image in my head of this podcast being successful, then I know, you know, people are going to start listening to it. It's going to start growing. It's going to start multiplying. And I know as long as I can keep pumping out episodes where I tell you guys fucked up stories or events or everything that happened, that you guys will like it because, you know, let's face it, it's not the most boring stuff that's out there. And it does provide you guys some value, right? At least I'm hoping so it does. So when I was on boot camp, uh, remember before I was telling you about my friend Muggsy? So this guy was crazier than fucking crazy. Like, he would go rob a bank. He, like, he had no remorse, but he was a genuine friend. He was he was such a good friend, I let him fuck my girlfriend when we were hanging out together. I was going to bang her with him, but I was too fucked up and I couldn't get it up, so I just let him have her. But, see, I, I'm not like that anymore. I've changed my whole perspective on relationships and women. I can get to that later as well. But uh I got a message when I was on when I was on boot camp that he died, that he overdosed. And it's weird because like he used to tell me, he used to have these premonitions in his dreams. And he would tell he's told me this several times. He says, Kenny, I would I'm gonna die saving you. And he told me this so many times when we were hanging out together in only the matter of like a year and a half maybe that uh when he died i said yeah bro you just did save me because i'm never gonna go back to that lifestyle because he died living that way in that fast life you know doing drugs and he didn't even die from an overdose but he died because he got so he 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 frauded somebody and the person that he frauded was also a criminal and they caught him and they trunked him and they beat the living shit out of him that he died later in hospital. And, uh, yeah, so oftentimes I'll think of him and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say thank you. And he'll be like, yeah, buddy, keep doing what you're doing because he used to talk like this and he had a real raspy voice. He didn't give a shit and he was white trash and he wore a bandana. Oh, yeah. His name is Muggsy. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, I just wanted to touch on that before I forget to. Um, so upon leaving boot camp and getting out on the street, I had uh, I had a lot of support now, and I had I had a mission and I had a plan, and my plan was to create and help co-create the Peak program on the street with the guy that created it. 
So when I got out, I was I had a job already lined up when I got out because these lovely two ladies came and spoke to us when we were on boot camp. And they told us that they had jobs for guys coming out of jail. And it was called Quality One Training and Support. And you can go there and work for them. And it was at the dump. And although it was the shittiest place to work because it was disgustingly smelly and you had chances of getting poked with HIV-infected needles, the working environment and the employees and the managing staff were wonderful and they helped you and they cared about you and they were genuine. And they had never before seen or had a candidate come and work for them that was so driven towards self-development, improvement, uh, life improvement and staying sober that I was. And out of the year that I worked there, I made sure I worked for a full year. I think it was like a year and three days. I only missed one day ever. And I was shooting and puking at the same time that day that I missed. And I was always there on time. And I always worked hard. And I was dedicated and committed to working my programs and, and making sure that I was a positive mentor for people at work and out of work. And I maintained always a level of integrity and respect that I did when I was on boot camp to other inmates and the guards. But but now I was in here in the real world and I still maintain that level of respect to myself and my friends and my family. And, you know, a big part of me changed, right? Like once my intentions changed, and the changing of my intention, I'd, I'd say for the most part right now where I'm sitting right today, that, that initial point where I changed my intention to to no longer be an asshole and to always try and do good and help people, that for the most part now, that's, uh, and, you know, it keeps me going every day. And I try to share that information with my friends and, and other people that are still struggling with uh, with their addictions. You know, uh, I I still have to do my affirmations. You know, uh one of my main affirmations I got from a book called The Master Key System, written by Charles Hanel in 1914. And uh, it's one of my favorite books, actually. When I found this book when I was in jail, I literally rewrote the book word for word. I copied the whole book down in my own writing. And it took me three and a half months. And I did so because every single page of that book had so much weight and truth behind it that I needed to learn it. And I think I did learn the master key system. It basically taught the law of attractions, but it taught a little bit more. And one of the, the most powerful affirmation that he states in that book is, I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy. I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy. I say that affirmation myself often, sometimes every day. Sometimes I forget to, but it's the one that I always go back to. You know, maybe I'll have a bad day or I'll be struggling emotionally and I'll have to, I'll have to make up a new affirmation for that emotion that I'm currently dealing with. I am happy. I love myself. I love myself. I love myself with my actions. That's a big one for me today is I love myself with my actions. You know, it took me a long time to actually tell myself that I love myself. I couldn't do it ever until I changed my intentions. But once my intentions were true, that I wasn't going to be an asshole anymore, I was able to look at myself in the mirror and stare directly into my eyes and say, I love you. Kenny, I love you. Kenny, I love you. Kenny, I love you. And when I say that enough times, I would get myself butterflies, not in a cute and fuzzy way, but in a way that a mother says I love you to her child and actually sends an energy behind it. I said that to myself. I started saying that to myself. And and today, even on my gloomy days, I'll use that and it will pick me back up. It will give me energy and it will remind me to stay true to my path and my purpose today. A pose from the peak program, which I'm still currently volunteering my time and effort towards creating uh, on the street. We, We had it up and running for 16 weeks successfully. We partnered with the library, which I helped pilot the program for. We videotaped each at, uh, we, each meeting. So we would have 
live content to bring to show for grants and so on and so forth. But I'm also involved in a couple of organizations other than that. And one is called Apathy is Boring. It's about social change and, and, and systematic change. The, it's a nonpartisan organization, but it's to en- engage youth in democracy. It's to engage uh, young folks, 18 to 30, to show them that they have the power within them to organ- organize and orchestrate amongst their peers to create changes in the systems that are around them, whether they be federal, municipal, or provincial, uh, or even just in their community. Like Together, if we organize ourselves, we have the power to create changes in our system. And that's what that program taught me. And it was really good because I got to advocate for the things that I was passionate about, about how I know that in the judicial system here in Alberta and Canada that there's not enough programming to actually help rehabilitate inmates. And, and all they really are doing is warehousing them and letting them become worse. It's actually inhumane. They provide better services to to animals at, at the Humane Society because at least they adopt them out to new families that will love them and take care of them. Here, they just send you back out on the streets with not a dollar in your pocket to fend for yourself and to teach yourself these life skills that you were never fucking taught. And they wonder why recidivism rates are so high up here. But hey, only in my opinion, right? But uh, I think that's about it for my time. Other than to say, like, you know, thank you guys for listening. I am doing really good right now. I've made a lot of changes in my life. And I got to this point how I explained to you by doing the self-work. And I know there's more to it that I didn't get to uh, get into. But before I go off on a political rant, I better shut her down. Uh, I'd like to do a big shout out to Liam Connolly at Connolly Law. So for all your Canadian law, will, and media issues, Google Liam Connolly Law. Please go to our Patreon page to support Southside Boxing Legion. 100% of your donations will be given to this not-for-profit. You can help a child box tomorrow. Why is it good to be a patron? Because being a patron gives you, the listener, access to Life on Life's Terms content forthwith. Instead of waiting to Thursday and Friday, at the cost of three Canadian coffees per week... You can get all of our content before anybody else. You become part of the family. You become part of Life on Life's tribe. Do that. Become part of our tribe. Thanks again, listeners. And I'll see you guys, hear you guys, you'll guys hear me in a couple days. Toodles.